You know, the Bible rarely calls people names. You know, I've been watching all these uh, debates going on, and people calling each other all kinds of names. But you rarely see that uh, in the scriptures. But there is one instance that comes to mind where the Lord calls a rich man a fool. I mean, in one place he said, you, know, you shouldn't call anybody a fool, but this man he, he calls a fool, probably because he deserved it. He calls the man a fool because this man allowed the love of money to make him forget some of the more important things in life. Familiar story. As I said, the um, story is found in Luke chapter 12 and it begins actually as someone interrupts Jesus with a question. So Jesus is with the crowd normally around him and you know, he's answering a question and so on and so forth. And then someone interrupts him. Uh, and the question uh, that interrupts him is about settling a money dispute over two brothers. And Jesus actually doesn't answer that question while well, he, he responds to it, but he doesn't go into detail answering, well, you know, you ought to go to a lawyer. He doesn't do any of that. He uses the question as a way to teach the group, the crowd, a lesson about the dangers of worldly mindlessness, uh, worldly mindedness rather, and selfish ambition. And he tells them the story of a certain wealthy man and basically shows them that there is no fool like, like a rich fool. No fool like a rich fool. So we go to chapter 12 of Luke and we begin in verse 13. Luke writes, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. So there's the, there's the question, you know, just dropping in out of nowhere, a dispute by these two fellows here, thinking, well, here's the rabbi, here's the teacher, he's wise and so on and so forth, you know, he'll settle the dispute. Of course, Jesus answers them, it says, and, uh, but rather he said to, uh, to him, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? so is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Very simple story, you know, don't have to explain the ins and outs of it, it's pretty straight forward. We see that the rich man was a fool, but not because he was rich. He wasn't a fool because he was rich or successful and he decided to retire, he wasn't you know, he wasn't a fool because he decided, look, I got enough money, I got all this stuff, I, I think I'm just going to take it easy. He's not a fool because of that. He was a fool because despite these blessings, he forgot several very important things. First of all, he forgot God. In the entire passage, he uses the words I, my, or mine 12 times, but not once does he mention God. He forgot that everything that happens to us does so with God's permission. And to make plans without reference to God is foolish indeed, especially plans on how to use his blessings. It's one thing to make you know, ordinary plans, well, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there, but when you are blessed, when you recognize you receive something that you don't deserve, it's just a, a huge blessing, 
to decide what to do with all of that without consulting the Lord, the source of the blessing? Foolish indeed. And so he forgot God. Secondly, he forgot other people. Not only did he not mention God, he did not even think of how his blessings could in some way benefit other people. I mean, obviously he had more than enough for himself, right? He had more than enough for himself and the only solution for the abundance was to build bigger barns so he could kind of maintain as much as he could for himself. Paul, the apostle, tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, that caring for other people is one of the primary responsibilities that we have in the use of our resources, in the use of our abundance. And so the rich fool forgot that one of the reasons that God blesses us is so that we might have the ability to bless other people. It's a wonderful promise that God makes. He tells us, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you enough so that you have enough for yourself and I'm even going to give you more so that you can give to someone else. Well, what a wonderful promise that is. Enough for me and enough for me to bless somebody else. But the rich fool, he was a fool because he just thought of himself. It never crossed his mind that his abundance might serve someone else. Thirdly, he forgot that man is more than just matter, molecules. Life is not just about having stuff. Life is not just about keeping our stuff or buying more stuff, or having the newest stuff, the coolest stuff, the most different stuff, the most exclusive stuff. That's not what life is about, although you wouldn't know that by watching television. Looking at all the, you know, the biggest complaint about, you know, about being online, the pop-up ads, you, can't, you, know, you want to just read something and you have to wade through all kinds of advertising. For what? Well, for stuff. Buy stuff. Have stuff delivered. Isn't Amazon Prime fun and dangerous? I mean, with just one little click, that's all it takes. You say, I like that. Buy now, it says. I like that. Yeah, sure, why not? Click, that's all you have to do. Your credit card is entered in, your address, they already know your address. Before you take a second breath, you, you've got an email waiting for you with your receipt. Thank you very much, sucker. <laughs> it is so easy for our life to just become a series of clicks. I want this, I want that, I want to look at that, I want to see that, I want to know this, click, 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 click. Life is about loving and knowing and serving God. I know, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here. I'm pretty sure all of us could pass that test if I asked that question on a, on a quiz. What is life about? What's most important? To know God, to love God. Mentioned this in our early class this morning. And this is eternal life, Jesus says, that you shall know God and His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what life is about. That's what eternal life is about. And yet, and yet, we are seduced in this life to click away our life and make our life just about stuff. And life is also about loving other people and experiencing that love from others. Maybe the flip side of the internet, right? Facebook, get to see your friends, your family, people, you stay in touch with a whole lot more people in a lot easier way than ever before. The old fashioned way, write a note, send a little letter, make a phone call. Huh, that takes time now, you can just, you know. You can do that while driving. <laughs> Not a good idea, mind you. And life is about experiencing that love from other people. That's what real life is about. I, I, Lise and I were, 
uh, watching a movie uh, recently, I think it's uh, Downton Abbey, uh, the, 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 the finale, and they tied up all of the loose ends. You know, great series, tied up all the loose ends on this soap opera. Happy ending, you know, the girl gets the guy, they get married, the other one does this, the other fellow gets the job that he's always wanted, and you know, a nice happy ending. And, and, and we were talking about these uh, romance movies, these uh, love movies, and so on and so forth, that the objective in all of these movies, they're making these movies cost 50, 100 million dollars, you know, and they've got these very good looking movie stars and they write these scripts and this and that, and everybody in the audience, what are we hoping for? That they will have the happy ending, right? And Lisa and I were talking and say, wait a minute, the thing that the happy ending is in the movie, well, that's what we got. <laughs> they making movies about what we've got. We love each other. We've been married 38 years. We have children. We have grandchildren. We love our children. Our children love us. Our grandchildren love us. You know, that's, that's our life. And yet when you watch a movie, isn't that the very best happy ending in a movie? <laughs> These made up stories, they have to make up stories so that the satisfaction will be that these movie stars, what are they getting? They're getting what we already have. Which is so, quote, ordinary. That's what life is that's what life is about. The rich fool, he forgot that the purpose of wealth is not to insulate yourself from other people. And by the way, that's one of the dangers of great wealth. You can just insulate yourself. You can, you know, you can build a moat around your house. You can build a high fence so you know, no ugliness gets to you. You're insulated from other people. You're not in contact with other people. You don't have to get your hands dirty with other people. The purpose of wealth is not to insulate you from other people, but rather give you the freedom to become involved in other people's lives for good. If you don't have to spend all that time scratching in the dirt to earn your living, and you've got a lot more free time, You've just been given a gift. What gift is that? You've been given the gift of time that you can invest in other people to make their lives better, to make their lives easier. So he forgot, the rich fool, that life is not about stuff, keeping stuff, hoarding stuff. It's about knowing God and in the name of God, loving other people in some way that they need. Number four, he forgot the source of real joy. He was excited and happy that he had more money, but he was only fooling himself in thinking that he could relax and be at peace now that he had bigger barns, or as we would have today, you know, uh, today we wouldn't call it bigger barns, we call it a gold-plated retirement, right? Like if you're a senator or something. <laughs> or a congressman, you, know, you got this nice, nice big fat pension going to take care of you, right? Had he lived, the rich fool, he would have uh, learned and he would have realized that it was a hassle maintaining those bigger barns because sometimes the roof leaks on the bigger barn or you got to replace the door on the bigger barn, right? In other words, the more you have, the more you got to take care of. The more you have, the more you have to repair and fix and protect. Fire could have destroyed his big barns. He could have been a target for thieves. He would have found out that increasing wealth does not increase one's peace of mind or joy. I repeat that. Increasing one's wealth does not necessarily increase one's peace of mind or joy. How do we know that? 
Well, the world is full of miserable millionaires, that's why. The source of real joy is, is, is the thing that we're talking about, faith in God and trust in Him. The source of real joy, personal righteousness and purity. The source of real joy, generosity. The source of real joy, hope, real hope for eternal life. That, that's the source of real joy. And all of these things I just mentioned, we know that. Money, money can't buy these things. Money can serve these things, but they can't buy these things. And the rich fool, he forgot that. He forgot that. He thought that having a lot of stuff made him rich. He didn't realize that having a lot of stuff, had he not died that night, would have simply caused him more stress, more concern, more involvement of the world, because the more of the world you own, the more the world owns you. Number five, he forgot about death. What does the Hebrew writer say in Hebrews 9, 27? It is given to man to die once, and then comes the judgment. It's the, and then comes the judgment part. That's a little scary at times. We should always you know, live our lives in such a way that we never forget that one day we're going to die. And more importantly, we're going to be judged. We should live always with that thought uppermost in our minds. Because this gives us freedom to try and to be the best. Because time is limited. I don't have time to waste on hatred and revenge and you know, these things. I don't have time to waste on that. Why? Because my time is limited. And it also gives us the wisdom to remember to obey the one who will judge us. And let's be assured, he will judge. So the rich fool enjoyed life so much, he forgot about death. He enjoyed himself so much, he forgot about judgment. He forgot to ask himself the question, how will God judge me in the use of what he's given me? We all have something, we all have some blessings. How will God judge us? Not, you know, we're always worried about the idea of, you know, how will God judge me? You know, did I you know, lie or cheat or sexual immorality, whatever. You know, we think of the, the moral things. But a lot of times we don't, we don't think, how will He judge us in the use of our gifts? In the use of the good things that He's given us? Has He given you good health? Has He given you stamina? Has He given you an opportunity to get an education? Has your life been one where you were born in a free country and you had access to everything because you were born in a rich and free country? What did you do with that blessing? You know, I often think our brothers and sisters in Haiti, for example, you know, an extremely, extremely poor country you have to kind of see it to believe it. Those who have traveled there and, and other places, I know uh, Dayton has been to a lot of developing countries. I mean, you have to see this kind of poverty to actually believe that it exists. You know, people living in boxes, literally boxes. You know, your refrigerator comes in a crate, well, that's somebody's house with tin you know, stuck onto it and, and leaves and more cardboard and, and, and some of these people are Christians. They come to services on Sunday and they pray and they sing a cappella and they take the communion and some brother gets up and preaches to them and they say amen and they go to Bible class and they have this and they have a fellowship afterwards and they talk in the foyer. I mean, you know, you'd feel quite at home at their service. And then when services are over, they go home to the box. They go home to the box. Our brother, our sister. And I've often said to myself, wow, 
I have all of this, when I say all of this, I don't just mean our congregation, I mean I have all of this, the U.S. of A. I have all of this, all the food I can eat, all the clean air I can breathe, I can go anywhere, do anything, I have all of this and I have heaven too. On top of all of this, I get to go to heaven. And my brother down there, he's got a box to live in and he's my brother. <laughs> and he's looking forward to going to the same heaven that I'm looking forward to going to. How have I used all of this? Because all of this was just given to me. I didn't earn it or deserve it. An accident or perhaps providential birth put me here and put my brother living in a box. I need to think about things like that. So there's no fool like a rich fool. All of the blessings and advantages of wealth that should have pointed this man to God in thankfulness. Because I'll tell you the truth, I'll tell you a secret. Sometimes in my prayers I say, Lord, this doesn't make me look good here. But thank you so much that I don't live in a box. Because <laughs> I know some of my brothers and sisters are living in boxes. And I didn't do that to them, but thank you so much that I don't live in a box. Well, the rich fool, he never made a prayer like that. It should have pointed him to God in thankfulness, his wealth. It should have pointed him to service, but instead he used his wealth selfishly. And his wealth served only to darken his heart and blind him to the true wealth that God will give freely to those who acknowledge Him. I know something else about my brother who lives in a box because I've met many of those brothers. And those brothers say, yes, I live in a box, but I'm going to heaven one day. And that thought, that thought keeps me sane while I live in the box. I believe that in comparison to many, we're the rich. Certainly in comparison to those in other countries, as I've mentioned, not just Haiti, but in Eastern Europe and Russia and China, other developing nations. I also believe that it's okay to be rich and it's a blessing from God to be rich and it should be accepted and it should be appreciated. I appreciate it. The danger, the danger is not just being rich, the danger is being a rich fool. So let's not fall into the same trap, shall we? Let's just remember, let's remember God in all that we have whatever that may be. Let's remember others and how we can use our resources to help others. Let's remember true living cannot be accomplished without reference to faith in God and involvement with other human beings. Let's remember peace and joy are spiritual things and they can only be obtained through spiritual activities. They're not commodities that can be traded or purchased on the stock market. And let's remember that in the end, God will judge everyone. So don't let those who are evil and succeeding discourage you. Because my brother who lives in the box, when I met him, he loved me. He loved me. He was happy to see me. Those of you who have been to Haiti, right? Happy to see me. I did not sense in any way a resentment in him because he lived where he lived and I lived where I lived. The only thing I sensed from my brother who lived in a box was that together 
we were both going to finally live in a mansion in heaven. And in the meantime, in the meantime, we had different living arrangements. Because in the end, God will judge everyone. So let's not be discouraged for those who have more than we have. In the story, God took the rich fool right in the middle of his planning and building and enjoyment. And you know what? That's how it works. We don't always have time to make the big turnaround. Have you ever had an accident, a car accident? Oh, let's, let's, let's make it even simpler than that. Have you ever just been in your house and tripped over a little carpet, you know, a little carpet in, in, the, in front of the sink? And you, you lose your footing, you trip and you fall and your head just goes woo, like this, just like a, an inch away from the corner of the counter. And had you fallen into it, concussion or death. And you fall down on the ground and you kind of, I mean, it's happened to me. Here, remember last winter, the, the steps, you know where the office is, you go outside through the office door and there are like five, four or five steps to go down in the winter. I said to Celestia, I'll go check the mail. I went outside and checked the mail and I slipped on a piece of ice and fell off of the step and went flying down and landed on my face on the concrete. And I laid there for a moment and thinking, you know, oh, surely I have broken something. You know, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, nothing, I just, nothing, you know, I'm, I'm okay. Just winded a little bit. That's how death happens. You're on your way to get the mail and then you're dead. Because you stepped on a piece of ice and you fell and boom, hit your head and you're, you're dead. In your living room, in your bathroom. You're driving along and you're just about to change the radio and somebody comes through and you're dead. You're dead. You're feeling fine one night, you go to bed, you wake up, you're feeling a little queasy, you go back and lie down and then you're dead. That's how it works. So we don't always have the opportunity you know, to make things right or to come back with God or you know, I'm going to make it all right one day. No. So the best time to make a change and to resolve to improve or turn away, the best time is always, well, right away, right now. That's why we encourage you to to do two things this evening. Why we always end, we always end the lessons. Marty, Mike, myself, Dayton, whoever's preaching, we always let, the lesson always is, ends the same way. Why? Because you might not make it back for the next service. That's why. Surely anybody who's been in this church for any number of years knows, <laughs> you know, how many funerals have we had? Five, six? Since the beginning of the year, we're, just, we're into March. We've had five, six funerals already. People who are handing in a prayer card, please, I'm going in for this surgery or I'm not feeling too well. On a Wednesday, we, we announce on the Sunday, oh, brother so-and-so passed away from that thing. That's why, we, that's why we make the announcement. That's why we make the invitation. So as far as this lesson is concerned, if you've forgotten some of the things like the rich fool? Maybe now would be a good time to make those things right in your life so that you can avoid the surprise of being called by the Lord when you're not ready. See, uh, uh, we don't know when we're going to die. We're never quite ready for that. When I've watched people die, usually they just want one more breath. They want, they're wanting to take one more breath of life. And then all of a sudden it's, it stops. They're never quite ready for that moment of death. But you can be ready to meet God. That you can do. You have control over that. So if there's something in your life, you know, even if it's not necessarily connected with the points that I've made here about the rich fool, make it right. If there's an apology, if there's, you know, make it right. And of course, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, well certainly, repenting, confessing Christ, being baptized, if you haven't done that, now that's really foolish, because that is absolutely, totally in your control. 
And we encourage you not to put that off either and to, to come to Christ. That'll be all right. So whatever your need, we sing the song of invitation. Bob's going to come up and lead us in that. If you're needing to be right with the Lord, if you're needing to answer the call of the gospel, this is a good opportunity. The church is here to witness your confession of faith. The elders are here to pray on your behalf. Take advantage of it if you need to, as we stand now and as Bob leads us in the song of encouragement. Bob.